This week, join me on a quest to learn the truth about a 3,000-year-old temple of doom, complete with sacred idols and secret rituals. The ruins of the ancient civilization of Chavin have stood for 2,500 years. But we're the first to make a full-length documentary here. How did this empire endure without the use of weapons and warfare? Was it a utopian society, or was it a warped experiment in mind control? My search for answers will take me through secret tunnels, deep within the Amazon jungle and into the hallucinogenic rituals of a modern-day shaman. And one other thing, there really is a temple of doom. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. It's kind of eerie. The centerpiece of the National Museum of Archaeology, the obelisk is a huge granite sculpture with images woven together like a tapestry. The first great Peruvian archaeologist, Julio C. Teo, discovered the artifact in the ruins of a massive temple complex 250 miles north of Lima. He called the civilization Chavin after the nearby town Chavin de Huantar. Reigning from 1000 to 200 BC, Chavin is one of the oldest and most mysterious cultures in Peru. The obelisk sat in the exact center of the circular plaza, at the heart of the complex, a position of supreme religious significance. Teo thought it contained the key to solving the mysteries of Chavin and what went on there. The principal image on the obelisk is a caiman, a South American relative of the alligator. Engraved within the caiman are many snakes, and a feline figure that's thought to be a jaguar, and plants, manioc, peanuts, and chili peppers. The strangest part of this code, according to Guillermo, is that the images on the obelisk don't come from the high Andes where it was found but rather from the Amazon jungle. But the jungle is far from Chavin. In the days of Chavin's glory, it was a punishing six-day trek by foot and llama train through towering mountains falling steeply to dense, impenetrable jungle. Why would a people who live 12,000 feet above the Amazon make jungle animals and plants the main characters in their Bible? 2,500-year-old ruins are beautiful centered around a sprawling temple made of massive stone blocks. It rises 53 feet high and looks down on 15 acres of sweeping plazas. To explore Chavin, I've arranged to meet Dr. Rosa Rick, co-director of the Stanford University project here. All over the site, we see the images from the jungle, jaguars and snakes. What are they doing up here in the highlands? But the connection between the Amazon and Chavin is just one of many mysteries that surround this ancient civilization. Chavin is complex and impressive, but I notice a strange absence. Rosa, I'm amazed at, at the beauty and the power, I mean, the wealth that was put into Chavin, everything here. And yet, what I don't see are fortifications. Did they have any here? No. Did they have a military? Nope. So how is it that they're able to, like, to protect all of these assets if they didn't have a military? That's a very good question. After years of excavation and research, the story is beginning to emerge. And it has to do with the special nature of Chavin itself. Chavin was a major ceremonial center. This is where population from all around the Indian area will converge. And how far would people travel to come here? Hundreds of uh, kilometers to yeah. get here. So this was a major pilgrimage site the way Jerusalem or Mecca made. That's right. It's a religious center. But what brought pilgrims to this inaccessible valley high in the mountains? Archaeologists speculate it was hypnotic mass rituals on the main plaza, with hundreds, maybe thousands of worshippers. The staging of the rituals was like a multimedia event. The priests had thought of every way to impress and amaze their followers. 
traded from hundreds of miles away, special conch shells were blown like trumpets, and their music reverberated off the walls of the temple. Five years ago, the Stanford team found 20 of these instruments, beautifully decorated with carvings. But the power of the ceremonies came from more than just music and dance. Rosa takes me to the circular plaza at the top of the complex to explain a brilliant special effect created by the priests. According to Rosa, they harnessed a nearby river and diverted its water into canals throughout Chavin. This canal comes from up underneath the steps and keeps flowing and it opens up to a series of canals that will go all through the ceremonial center. It's like a big speaker, loud sounds coming through the Wow, so it sounds everywhere. Roaring sounds. It was a remarkable feat of engineering. Over two miles of underground canals traversing the entire temple complex, all to heighten the effect of the ceremonies. The sound must have been overwhelming. That's incredible. So this, this whole space, I mean, with the temple behind us and the water rushing through underground and then coming back here, it's just this whole area was, again, a ceremonial center. This reinforces that something significant is going on here. That's it. This was why Chavin had no military. It was on sacred ground. It ruled by the power of its rituals. Its protected cult status shielded it from attack. Archaeologists have found offerings that were brought by devotees from as far away as the coast. The accumulated wealth supported a huge settlement for its time and place. Over 3,000 people. A thriving community of artisans served the needs of the priests. Chavin pottery, goldwork, and textiles have been found hundreds of miles away to the south, and to the north. The Chavin style of intricate design and strong animal imagery dominated the entire region. It was a cultural empire in Peru for 800 years, ruling through the persuasive force of its ideas. And Rosa tells me the priests used a unique method to help maintain their dominance. You have a priest representation here. You can see the headdress with the snake designs. Look at the mouth with the fangs and the hands with the claws. And we observe that he's holding a San Pedro cactus. Rosa explains that when correctly prepared, San Pedro cactus is a potent hallucinogen. Clutched in the priest's hand, it's a symbol of tremendous importance to his religion. It's the key to his power and his control of thousands of devoted pilgrims. Christian, what's your specialty? Christian um, Messia, co-director of the Stanford Project at Chavin, tells me more about the priest's use of hallucinogenic drugs 2,500 years ago. And the archaeological evidence is startling. Wow. Oh my god, look at all this stuff. Sitting in a shed, protected from the weather, are many of the stone heads which once lined the temple complex. Yeah, there's one in particular I wanted to show you. Yeah? Yeah, which is this one. Oh, this one here, huh? Exactly. So what's so special about this one? Can you see that? Oh, yeah, this. Mm-hmm. That's mucus. Mucus? Exactly. Okay, wow. That's a bit weird. Why do they represent this person with mucus? Well, when you consume uh, psychoactive substances uh, through the nostrils, you get that like, mucus flowing. Ah. And they actually captured the mucus coming out of his nose mm -hmm. in stone. Exactly. So what role did these hallucinogens play in the society? Well, what, I, what we believe here in the project is that it was a very, a really important part. It's so important that it was depicted on the facade of the main temple, at the most sacred place in Chavin de Huanta. I've never seen anything quite like this collection of stone heads. So was this I asked Christian to show me where they were 2,500 years ago. Evidence, which is the tenon head, is the only now, tenon only one is left in its original position. It was part of the whole wall. It was inserted in those holes that we see along the wall. 
and this this tunnel head, particular tunnel head, is representing some form of transition between a human being and a jaguar. So this is yeah, half feline. I can see it. It's got the teeth in mm -hmm. the mouth and the feline, mm -hmm. but I guess the head, the eyes are human. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, but what is it? Well, we assume that the divinity was living in another world. So in order to get to that world, you have to consume some sort of substances. They will lead you. They will put you in a state of mind. They will lead you to that world in order to enter to that world. Actually, this represents the transformation from human to feline. Exactly. There and that go. was done through taking a substance, some sort of mm -hmm. hallucinogen. Mm -hmm. Wow. A society that surrounds its most holy center with sculptures of hallucinating jaguar people with mucus coming out of their noses is truly bizarre. That subject, and Christian has more to show me. We have found just like two days ago these snuff tubes. You have to be very careful, extra careful, they're very delicate. Okay. That we found in a canal. Snuff tube? Yeah. Wow. This is a bone, yeah? Probably it's a bear bone. Dozens of these bone snuff tubes have been found in Chavin. Sometimes intricately carved, they were used to inhale powdered hallucinogens. Tiny mortars and pestles were used to grind up the psychoactive ingredients. Some were from the Amazon jungle, like the seeds of the yopo and the resin of the varola tree. What Rosa and Christian have shown me changes my perception of Shavin and its rituals completely. And the story becomes stranger and stranger. This is the saga of a cult built around hallucinogenic plants, the cult of Shavin. The ceremonies on the outside were just the beginning. From the circular plaza, Rosa takes me up enormous steps which created the thundering noise of water flowing through canals. Up until 2,200 years ago, priests used the same stairway to lead a chosen few initiates into an actual temple of doom. And, of course, in every proper temple of doom, there has to be a terrifying idol hidden inside. Yes. The temple above ground is just an entranceway into this massive labyrinth. Huge stones were used to build over two miles of tunnels. Would there have been candles in this passageway? We don't have evidence of candles used at that time. Mm -hmm. There is no signs of the smoke on the walls. It's kind of eerie. I'm surprised by what Rosa just told me. I've been in tunnels like this in Mexico and in Egypt. But there was almost always evidence of the use of fire to light the way. How did they see where they were going without torches? They would have been in complete darkness. So is there any sense of what was going on in rooms like this or down here in the corridors? This may have been to bring some of the initiated people and to break them down. So more of like the cult of Chavin. The initiates were down here in the darkness being reprogrammed by the priests? That's right. For Rosa, it's a classic psychological technique. Disorient people in order to brainwash them. And to prepare them for what they were about to see. Oh, wow. And there it is. It is the supreme deity of Shavin, a god in stone illuminated by a single beam of light from a tiny ventilation shaft. Archaeologists call it El Lanzon, the lance, because of its shape. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. An intricately carved, massive face with its lips curled in a perpetual snarl. So these initiates would come down this dark corridor. They're in altered states of mind due to some drugs. And they come in here, and they're standing face to face with this really psychotic looking god. And this, this is just, this is a very powerful figure. Why don't experience overwhelming?
It must have been a psychedelic blur of fear and awe. In the dark, the sound of water rushing past through acoustic canals would have added an element of heart-pumping dread. This sort of stormy sound. On top of everything that they're going through, they're hearing this thundering noise in front of this guy. That is one other reason for them to be fearsome of this figure. The God is talking to them. I can only imagine what they must have been experiencing. It all seems so bizarre. Pervasive use of hallucinogens, ritual ceremonies in dark underground tunnels, brainwashing. How would such techniques enable Shavin to become a cultural empire? 